When you write a book, people ask you two questions. What's your book about? And like most of the time they don't care because they want to get to the second question. How did you write this book? Because I have a book I want to write. So tell me the magic, right? Today on Getting Scaled, I've got Tucker Max, who had three New York Times bestsellers on the list at the same time. He's written another New York Times bestseller, created a company called Scribe Media, which has been touted as being one of the best places in all of Austin to work and, and you know, highly acclaimed with the culture. Uh, yeah, so he's a prolific writer. Uh, he's also a prepper. We talk a little bit about that. He also has a pretty popular article on MDMA therapy, which is a great thing for going in and healing childhood trauma and wounds and a lot of these emotional things that get trapped in our body and show up as physical pain. And he really changed my life that way. So quite a fascinating character. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Tucker, what's up, man? Good to see you, Garrett. Good to see you out in Austin, Texas, out in the outskirts. No, I am in Dripping Springs, Texas. I, am I know where Dripping Texas. Springs is, man. I Because uh, the academy that we hung out at isn't too far from Dripping Springs. Yeah, Wizard Academy yeah. in Driftwood, which is like 20 minutes from here. Yeah. Wizard Academy sounds like we just go and like play role play type of shit, right? right like on fair or something, right? <laughs> What's wrong with these nerds? I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dude, so you uh, created Scribe, and then I, I've referred a bunch of people. I've actually been through your book workshop twice. Oh, yeah. I remember people like, you already wrote a book. Why did you come to this workshop? I'm like, because if you want to get something done effectively, you come right here where it gets done in a very short period of time. And I think what you've built there is really brilliant with that outlining process. Thank you. Yeah. Um, dude, how did you get three books on the New York Times at the same time? Like, what was that? I wrote how did you do that uh, i wrote the trite answer would be i wrote really great shit that people wanted to read that's not wrong but the the larger answer is there's kind of two things uh one is i i had the right thing to say at the right time right so when i when i wrote you know i hope, I hope this is your beer in hell and assholes finish first and hilarity ensues it was a period Man, it's the period that we're in now, socially and culturally, it was the very beginning of that period. It, it, and before a lot of people, had, so like we're kind of seeing the culmination of, where, of what that period was. But it was the very beginning of the period where um, uh, I think the way I would frame it is the very early stages of wokeism were, were planted, definitely in the academy, in, in you know, uh, university but uh but they were starting to seep into culture um uh, radical feminism like like meaning like anti-man uh was was really kind of mainstream and the idea that uh the, the pendulum had really started to swing and was was almost near its peak of the sort of anti-man anti-patriarchy sort of idea right which like I get what the reaction was against you know the 50s or 60s or whatever but it was it, it had gone too far and um and so the like literally in media men could only be one of two things this is kind of before soys right so a men could be a, a man could be a cad or a dad like on tv or media meaning like you got to be like like everyone loves raymond right like the iconic sort of dopey dad that everyone like uh, shits on and talks shit about or a cad yep. And they could be like, uh, how I met your mother, right? Like they get the gay dude to play the cat, which of course is hilarious. You can be like a dude or quagmire, right? Like that, that archetype, like, uh, yeah. you could be, uh, one of those two things and that's it. And so I, uh, I wasn't trying to crack that, uh, veneer or rebel against that. All I did was write true stories about my life at, with my real name and uh, I was so young at the time. I started writing about 27 uh, and got big pretty fast. So by 32, uh, 31, 32, my stuff was, you know, uh, uh, chugging along in New York Times and I settled this. And um, dude, it was crazy, man. It was like, I was just young and stupid and naive enough to not realize that telling the truth was going to catapult me to fame, but also put a target on me. Like I was the little kid who said the emperor's name, you know, mommy, why does the emperor right. not have clothes on? Do you know what's crazy? 
So that's a real fable. It's, a, it's an old school um, Hans Christian Andersen, which probably means it's long before then, a European fable. Do you know, in America, the way we tell that story is the kid says, Mom, why is the emperor naked? And then everyone wakes up, right? He's like, oh, the dude doesn't have clothes on, right? Do you know how the original fable goes? How? In Europe? They kill the kid. Now, see, oh, you can read yeah. the old school, like the, like the 1911 translation. And the story, in the story, the kid says out loud, why does the emperor have no clothes on? And I think the mom kills the kid or, or the other villagers, whatever, kill. And because the, the fable is teaching to shut up about mass delusion because it's a good way to get killed. Even if you see it, don't say it out loud, right? Yeah. And so America had a window where you could say those things out loud and you would have a target on your back, but you wouldn't be killed. I was, I came up in that window, right? You, like Just at the right was, time. Just at the right time. I was the dude who was willing to tell the truth about how guys thought and acted and did. And it wasn't just men who like me. I mean, like you don't sell millions of books just to men, right? Like most dudes don't read. So like I had sold millions of books to women as so, well, like probably half my fans were women. And so, you know, cause it, it was funny and women like reading about men. Men only like reading about men, uh, but women also like reading about men and women. So I sold a ton of books and, and I, like it, 10, 20 years before, like the seventies, I at best would have had limited fame. I never would have gotten big public traction. And now, I mean, good, good. I'd have to be Andrew Tate or someone like that, or Alex Jones. I would have to be a marginalized extremist kook, right? So like, I kind of had, I, I hit that window um, and that's why my stuff took off. So the point, to answer your question, having the right thing to say at the right time, but then also working really hard on it, you know, and, and doing a, like I took my craft series. So it's so you invested funny. in that skill set and really dove in. So, and I, I, I never draped myself in literary pretension. I hated that. Um, but it, it's like, it's funny. Cause if I had, I think my career would have gone very differently. Not, not necessarily better, it just very differently. Right. And, um, for me, what mattered was sales, right? I wasn't writing to be a pretentious writer. I was writing to entertain people, which means it had to be good. Most writers don't write for the result, uh, meaning the sales result. They're not writing to sell copies. They're not writing to entertain. And I put selling copies and entertain together. They're not always okay. exactly the same, but they're pretty close. The other bucket is st social status. Most writers write for social status. They want to be liked by a certain group of people. I don't get yeah, that. Those <laughs> when I started killing sacred cows in 06, my real intention was I just wanted to be cool. I wanted to be known. I wanted like it was a dumb. I it was so for two years it did nothing because it wasn't enough purpose. And even when I look at this last book I just wrote versus that book, like even just the conversations we've had, I'm writing with so much more emotion and so much more depth. And I'm doing the writing instead of like outsourcing it like I did that first book. So I appreciate that. I also think it's ironic that I bought, I hope they serve beer in hell for Joe Polish before you knew who I was or you knew who he was. And I, and then to think that that's a book that I bought and yet your article on MDMA therapy changed my life, like yeah. completely changed my life. Like totally, like I've done like seven dope. full sessions and like dove into childhood stuff, dealt with physical pain that was actually emotional pain. I mean, it just is funny that, you know, that kind of a trajectory essentially. I, I know, and you, what's even more funny is like, I can, I, I then went to Joe's mastermind. I think we met it at Genius Network, didn't we? Or was it- somewhere? We either met at Maverick or Genius or MMT. It's one, I, I, no, I we both remember. spoke at MMT uh, Mastermind Talks when you had Book in a Box. You oh, yeah, spoke that year and I spoke on relationships, not on finance. So it was super confusing for anyone's brand that is in finance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know, I know, that's so funny. People do that to me all the time. They're like, what's your brand? And I'm like, I'm a human, dude. They're like, why are you talking about <laughs> this when your brand's this? And I'm like, stop it. <laughs> but you're right. It is also very confusing. Yeah. Well, yeah, like I give the speech and someone comes up to me like, my wife loved that talk. We want to hire you to consult us. I go, I gave you all I know about relationships in that talk. There's nothing to buy. I gave you 
all there is there anything beyond this would be you donating money at this point <laughs> yeah, no it's true i get a lot of people who want me to coach them through like it'd be an integration coach for them with psychedelics and uh like i just like no <laughs> what what it, now I, I get asked so many times eventually i did i do actually have like two or three clients now but like what i started doing was uh just naming a price that's so unreasonable and so ridiculous that if they took it i'd be like super excited to do it and so i would dive in and do a really good job right and so my clients are like uh like i can't tell you who they are obviously but like uh like the you know, founder and ceo of a major public company like another person is super famous like I, I, if you got them on your podcast you would kick me off the podcast to record with them like and so like i i actually am a coach now for two i just finished with one so two currently two but maybe three clients and all i did like for that exact thing dude so i what i learned from that is i'm just gonna talk about whatever i want and then if people come to me wanting coaching or stuff i'm just gonna name like the price not what i would take the price that would make me super excited to do it <laughs> and then if they say no cool i win if they say yes cool i win Nice. No. I like it. Yeah, that article's got a lot of traction. I actually put the article in my last book, Disrupting Sacred Cows, because of the impact it Did had you on me. The whole thing in there? I just put the link to it oh, okay, so okay, that okay, people okay. could go there and mention it and just gave them some keywords to look it up. Yeah. yeah. Um, because I, I put together. Thing, but it'd be a lot to put in someone else's book. <laughs> it's like 9,000 words. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's, like a, it's, it's like a mini book, essentially, but yeah. it's. You know, it's it's super helpful, and I think it's it's got to be something that you're strangely known for now versus just the uh, hope I serve beer in hell guy. It is, it is. I get um, uh, when the Wall Street Journal did a huge piece about psychedelics like a year ago, and I was like one of the main people they interviewed in that. Um, I get, I probably get, I still get two or three emails a week from people who will find that piece, or I just wrote a piece called The Beginner's Guide to Psychedelics, because I was getting so many people asking me these questions. I just kind of put it all in like a guide and said, go read for free, just go read that. And um, I'll get two or three people a week who are asking me for referrals to guides, because it's still for most people pretty hard to find underground guides. And so I always tell, like every podcast I go on where it comes up, I'm like, listen, if your listeners want to email me, uh, I, I know two guides who are willing to take blind referrals, like you know, people I don't know, because most guides are like, I don't want that because obviously they're doing shit that's illegal and they could go to jail and God forbid some, you know, FBI agent or local cop decides to like go after people. It's not going to happen, but if they did, right? And so right. Um, I still get a ton of email for that. Dude, I do. I think I get more email for that now than I do for my books, I think. Yeah. It's yeah, funny. That's, that's funny. Also, I like that one of the stories people always want to ask you about is that you played basketball with Obama so that you had to just write an article about it so you didn't have to describe it all the time. <laughs> Dude, it was so annoying. I know. It, yeah, it's uh, Which was totally random. It was a chance. He was a law professor in the University of Chicago when I was an undergrad there. Like, that's... You talk about blind chance. I could have literally been in his inner circle if I wanted, but I didn't... I didn't dislike him, but I just didn't really... Like, we didn't... We didn't connect, shockingly. Who would have thought? <laughs> <laughs> he didn't connect with the I hope they serve beer in hell guy? No, no. He was a little uh, uh, He was a little leftist for me, even then. It's, fun. Dude, <laughs> right. it's so funny, man. Someone on Twitter said that the other day. They were like, they were like whoever, uh, uh, who, I don't know who came up with the based and strapped Tucker Max character uh, art turn, but I'm down for it. And I was like, I don't know. That's first of all, it's hilarious. He's talking about me like I'm some character and not a person. But then right. also, I was like, well, that is a very funny way to put it. Yeah. But I have always been, in my opinion, pretty based. It's just when I was younger, my attention was, you know, on women. <laughs> that was what I focused on. But it's not like right. I like I didn't like guns or I couldn't see the the nonsense or whatever. I just wasn't like. I, like Alex Jones is going to spend his life talking about that. Yeah, maybe I'll spend a few years. I, I want to talk about women when I'm 28 and single. Let's talk about <laughs> right. girls, you know. And now, you, like, so you you left kind of the city and you're living out in the country. And you know, I saw like you had shot a deer and teaching your kids how to how to dress the deer and all that. I mean, I I love elk hunting. I'm going for the next couple of weeks, taking my dad with an me. Elk with a bow. I remember with like, a bow. Yeah. I mean, that's not it's not unheard of, but. 
Like, you don't just casually bow hunt elks. That's a serious thing, man. That's I'm, like, I'm like, shooting my bow almost every day right now. And, uh, yeah. And it's cool because my dad's like 70 and he's out working out every day. We go hiking together. Yeah, um, I wanna, so hold on. Stop for a second. Yeah, I don't think your yeah. listeners understand. Elks are not like cows, right? Like elks They're like are a thousand pound huge. beast. Right, yeah. two to three thousand pounds. <clears throat> antler, like males, the bulls have will have antler racks that can be like five feet tall and like eight feet wide. Those things can kill you. Like seriously, they can hunters die every year from elk attacks. Yeah. I nice. went to leave to hunt and my wife started bawling. She's like, I'm so afraid you're going to die. I'm like, babe, you tell me I'm your warrior. And then I go out to get meat and you think I'm going to die. That doesn't really inspire me. I'm a warrior because I have a wallet, not because I actually can go out in the nature, I guess. huh? Dude, I mean, when I, even when I, I don't really do it hunting deer, but when I hunt uh, hogs, you know, like, like feral hogs, I, I, you know, rifle, I also have, you know, a gun on my chest or hip. Man, because those things can kill you. Elk are, elk are five to ten times bigger, right? Like that's and you're bow hunting too. If you were rifle hunting, you know, hitting them from eight hundred yards, that's still cool and whatever. But I'm like, okay, that's not dangerous, bro. Bow hunting, no. you're forty yards away. <laughs> like you can touch the goddamn thing almost. Yeah, the one I killed, I killed one that was twenty five yards away. He didn't see where I was at. Yeah. And I then... can throw a football 25 yards easily, actually. Like, that's so close. That is crazy. That is, that is a, a that is a pretty mid, mid-level NFL out pattern is 25 yards. <laughs> yeah. I, I just want people to understand. You're not just a finance dude who tells some funny jokes. Like, bro, you bow hunt elks. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, keep going. I mean, I, I just, you know. I, I know what it takes to bow hunt. And I have not even been bow hunting for elks yet because I don't trust my archery skills enough. And I'm like, yeah, I, I'm not really ready to roll those dice yet. I will eventually. Well, for, your, for years, I would do what I would call a meat hunt. I would just go hunt cow elk with my gun. And I was getting so good at it that one year Four. I missed the easiest shot in my whole life. And I came home. My wife's like, where's the elk? I'm like, babe, it's hunting. It's not gathering. It's not catching. Like I, I still have to, you know, murder an animal, which makes me feel slightly bad. And then she's like, "Animals were meant to be eaten." I'm like, I like that my wife's kind of savage that way, you know. They, they don't have them lined up in the back of Costco, and you shoot, you come back. And yeah, just, I'm like, dude, these things are like, not. like one year I had to sprint up a hill. I was running with my gun. I stopped when it stopped for a second, shot it. I felt so badass. And then the next year. The thing was standing a hundred yards away. I shot, and it. I thought, oh, for sure, I got it. No, it just walked away, unharmed. That's bad to miss a hundred no, yards. God, I will admit. It, it. Broadside, hundred <laughs> yards broadside. I had to. I must have just like pulled the gun or something because I was like, it was too easy. Right. It was like this is too easy, yeah, but it wasn't. A hundred yard rifle shot is the opposite of a twenty-five yard bow shot. A hundred yard yeah. rifle shot, my son can hit, and I know this because he's rung steel at forty. Uh, 478 yards so i i would give the gun to my eight-year-old to take that shot yeah that fair fair but i did you know and then i hit it i hit an elk with a bow 85 yards away last year 85 yard dude it was crazy i wasn't gonna shoot and then it just stopped that, i and mean that's turned. a borderline unethical shot 85 yards i i that think really i think a hundred i think a hundred yards is where I would well, definitely well, not how shoot. Did you bow or do you use? You gotta be using like a seventy, 80. seventy pound. Yeah, it's it's tough to pull a seventy pound. To I only shoot fifteen that shots is, at a time, and then I'm tired. And I'm like, cool. I'm with you, but like uh, my understanding, the rough understanding is, and I'm not a bow hunting expert. I mean, I have a nice bow, but not because I'm good at it, just because I have money. And um, uh, <laughs> I like how casually you say that. That's true. I've got total badass bow that's that is not reflective of my ability because it's super good. Um, that the p pound pull of the bow roughly approximates the yard distance you should shoot it with, the max yard distance you should yeah, shoot it yeah. with. Right? And so, like, I, I figured what mine's like a 65 pound pull. And so the dude's like, if you go out beyond 65, uh, it's unethical, right? Well, what happened was he was actually, his AYR was, I, I 
ranged it at 73, but that's AYR. So I didn't know he was 85 yards because it was up a hill. You shoot at your 70 yard pin. But then when we paced it, it was 85 yards because of the incline. Because you shoot as if you're shooting straight still forward. You still, still a good hit job. Him. Yeah. Shit, bro. So. All right. I, I did not yeah. know I was going to learn about uh, bow hunting on this podcast. That is that is news. <laughs> well, part of part of like what I like is that you've really created this quality of life where you guys, you know, moved. You've got, I think, goats, probably chickens. I mean, you've got this whole thing Sheep, going chickens, on. Cows. Sheep, chickens, cows, dogs, kids. Yeah. 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 yeah, we got a flock of sheep, like a lot. Like, a, like I'm an actual shepherd now. Like, not a metaphorical shepherd. <laughs> I mean, literal shepherd. Yeah. Metaphorically, it's more entertaining, I think. I, I know. I know. Like, <laughs> no, it's actual, like a flock of sheep. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, uh, so you've got this lifestyle going on, but also part of that is like you're not actively involved in scribe like you were you hired a seat like this whole process of like the the caliber of like culture that you built there how you built the business like that's what i'd like to unpack a little bit and help people understand because most people don't believe it's possible and you made some really strategic decisions now i don't know if that was luck skill or laziness or what it is but i would love to kind of hear what it was and how it happened all right well so all right where do i start so like the business started by accident um, uh, when you're, I, and I know, you know what I'm about to talk about, cause you're an author too. When you write a book, people ask you two questions. What's your book about? And like most of the time they don't care cause they're, they want to get to the second question. How did you write this book? Cause I have a book I want to write. So tell me the magic. Right. And so, um, I only got that question 10,000 times. Uh, and I never thought about turning it into a business for a couple of different reasons, but and eventually this woman kind of called me out on this. And so I, I figured out a way to help her write her book without having to be a ghostwriter, like a, like a real true, you know, uh, dive deep in the material, research it, ghostwriter. Like her words, her ideas, her thoughts, me just the scribe, right? Instead of, like, you kind of have to be a writer to understand the difference between a scribe and a ghostwriter, but a ghostwriter is putting a lot of their own work into the book. Uh, ideas, thoughts, a scribe is essentially just transcribing stuff and making it work on the page roughly. And so, um, I came up with a process that worked really well. Uh, actually, no, I didn't, I didn't want to do it. And so this guy, Zach Oberant was helping me with some other project. I'm like, look, man, this one wants to pay me 10 grand for this. It shouldn't be long. Do you want, me? I'll tell you what to do. If you want to do it, I'll split the money with you. And he's like, yeah, that sounds awesome. So we did that, split the money. She started recommending people to me like uh and then i was like why are you wrecking like why are you sending these people to me she's like well you did a great job I'm like, yeah but so what i don't want to do more <laughs> and she's like she's not as an idiot which i am and so uh i, I just kept asking <laughs> everyone to zach and um then i went on lewis house's podcast to talk about something else and he's dyslexic and we started talking about writing and i kind of casually mentioned what i was doing with this woman and lewis is like Oh, what do you call that? Well, your new company. And I'm like, what? <laughs> new company. And uh, I, I literally came up with the name Book in a Box in the moment, which is, you know, descriptive. Not necessarily the best name, but but good enough for the moment. Right, a good process name. It is. And um, we had like $250,000 in sales in the next month because of that one podcast. And Zach's like, hey, dude, I think we got a business here. And I'm like, really? You think like that's how dumb of an how slow I was? As an entrepreneur. And so then, uh, uh, you're then busy like, writing and and doing other I shit. Even writing, man. I was cashing <laughs> checks and I had a wife and a new young kid and all that. So I was like, kind of just coasting, honest. To be totally honest. And um, so I kind of dove into that, and we did pretty well, really well for the first year, year and a half. Did like two, two and a half million in sales, and then the wheels came off, dude. Like once we hit about. Eight, I think it was about 10 employees, 11 employees, and something like 100 clients, uh, or maybe it might have been 75, the wheels just came off. And um, it, essentially, once we went from, I can contain this in my head, to I cannot. Uh, and I, I didn't, I would assumed because I was smart, and good at school, and good at writing, and good at some other things that I mean, I knew idiots who ran big businesses. Like, how hard could it be? And uh, I was wrong. 
it's much, much, much harder <laughs> than I realized. And not only was it harder, but like I didn't like it. I really did not like the job of of running a business and scaling a business. Right. I really hate it. Because scaling a business is basically understanding money, finances, and spreadsheets and stuff, which I hate, and uh, coaching people. Which yeah, I, I noticed your wife came to my workshop, not you, by the way. I, exactly. you know, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> like, I don't like either of those things. And so I was like, ah. Oh. And then, uh, man, I got really lucky. Uh, most entrepreneurs eventually realize, okay, uh, I'm probably I'm the visionary. I need to find the integrator, you know, the organizing person, the ops right. person, right? And um, I had that realization, but I didn't know what to do. And we hired someone. She was a total disaster. Like I hired someone from some corporate place, like an idiot, and it was horrible. Like the first day, she's like, "Oh, you know, we're like a ten-person startup," and she's like, "You know, when when do I get my company computer?" And I'm like, "Oh no." Fuck. <laughs> so, uh, that was a disaster. I had to fire her. But we had this client who was a total badass, and um, I was like getting. He was a he was a president of a software company in Austin, a big one, like hundred million dollar company. And I kept asking him questions about how to be a CEO, and he would give me this amazing feedback. And, uh, and then he also he was critiquing our process as he would go through it, and he gave. Right. Um, so he was a client him. essentially, is how you met him. Both, yeah. yeah. And, and eventually I was like, dude, will you just come run my company, please, man? I don't know what to do. <laughs> I don't know what to do. And I got so lucky, man. The software company he was at, he was not he was not the founder. Wouldn't give him equity. And I'm like, I'll give you whatever you want if you do a good job. And so, and I to, to be just honest. And so it came on, I forget even what the original deal was, but like 10, he's going to get 10% with like an earn out and blah, blah. After like two or three years, he had ten, three years, he 10 X the size of the business. And I'm like, okay, we need to redo this deal. What do you need to stay forever? Like, I'll give you anything. Like I'm not in a position to negotiate, which you would think is a terrible negotiation strategy. And it would be with most people, but with him, but you knew him, I knew him well. And what he really wants was, um, validation and appreciation. And so by me, you figured out his currency, you know, his currency, I, I understand yeah. what, what matters to him. Right. Yeah. And so by coming to him before he had to bring it up and by essentially, um, telling him I'd give him anything he wants. And I, I don't have like, I, we, we can't scale this company without it because this dude was a master at scaling a company. So it's like, you probably should have him on your podcast because he's way better than me at, at understanding that. Although I can tell you what he did, but, um, uh, he, we came up with a deal. Essentially, Zach got a, a quarter of the company, and then he and I split the rest, so like 37.5%. And a lot of people are like, oh, man, you had to give up, because I had 75. Like, you had to give up a lot of equity. I'm like, yeah, yeah, sort of. So, But my choice was I could have 75% of, let's say, a $4 million a year business at maturity, or I can have 37.5% of a company that, that last year did uh Christ, uh, six, seven times that. And then this year is going to do wow. probably not 10 times, but close. Right. And so it's like, w which would you pick? You know, you like, you want a small. And, and by the way, if you keep 75%, it's a grind for you. Oh, You're not doing what you enjoy. I got to but... do the work. Right. Right. <laughs> right. So... People struggle with collaboration because we're kind of ingrained with competition and, and the rugged individualism of America and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, yeah, like, self-reliance is critical with everyday life but self-reliance in business becomes the thing that's a ceiling of you know like just slowing everything down because of ego or because of whatever that might be you know 100 percent. i definitely had some of the ego traps uh, like i almost he came on board and like he set a trap for me i don't even think this was intentional he's like i'll be coo and president if you want you can say ceo and i was like no that would be bullshit because I am hiring you to do the CEO's job. And so for me to sit in that chair would just be dishonest. At a minimum, I would look myself in the mirror every day and know I'm a liar. And so I'm not going to do that. And that's another thing. Like he just loved like that honesty and who I was and all that. And so, um, uh, uh, but I mean, he, I, I, all I, what he allowed me to do was spend all of my time. I'm going to sound like Dan, Dan Sullivan now. He allowed me to spend all of my time in my unique ability, which was I really know books and I really, I like, I understood our process. I really set up our, not 
the operations of our process, but the structure of how do you uh, uh, either teach people, like in the world, we have two big kind of offerings. We have like a, a, a guided, like a coaching, and then a, a call it ghostwriting, but a scribing work. So I did create both processes, right? How they actually work, not the scale for them, but how they work. And so I was really good at that. And then also really good at marketing. Like, how do you get it? How do I get attention for us? How do I get people in the door? And, and so I spent all my time on those two things. And, I, and, and he'll, he'll gladly tell you, he's like, man, if I had to do marketing, I'm not sure what I would have done. Like, I didn't have to worry about it hardly at all for years because Tucker just did Tucker's thing. And I could focus on operations and hiring and coaching and finance and cash flow, right? Um, and so that's really the, the trick. It's not just finding an operational wizard, uh, which a lot of people think is all I did. Um, it, it's finding someone whose skill set is uh, uh, matches mine, right? In terms right. of contrast, like they are they they can do all the things I can't do and don't want to do, um, or and they can you... hire and manage those people, and it leaves me free to do the things that I'm very good at that really no one else can do. You know, at least in my company. Right. For, you're pretty smart, but the, remember the time where you told people, hey, Garrett's a comedian, just tell him to say something funny every time you see him. And I then just said, if anyone says that to me, I'm going to tease Tucker. It's going straight to Tucker every time when they're like, say something funny. I'm like, just going to roast Tucker, yeah. you know, yeah. and yeah. I have <laughs> I now have evidence that you think I'm funny because that when I was roasting Canada at Mastermind Talks, they snapped those pictures and you're la your head's back laughing. So I was like, I felt good about that, you know? Yeah, you should, if, if Jason will let you, you should get that clip. And like, that should just be a, like a podcast episode, like that 10 minutes. It It's not even, it, it was very good jokes, but the best part was like, he, he did put you on the spot. It was rough, man. I remember thinking, fuck, I'm glad he didn't hand the mic to me, right? Like, uh, I mean, I could make a few candid jokes, but I, being totally unprepared and being able to roast and being able to roast are not the same thing. Like it's yeah. it, the degree of difficulty is much harder when you, you aren't even thinking about it. You're not in that mindset, you know? Um, and it, it took you about 30, 45 seconds, but then you yeah. got on track and then it was all downhill and you just, you, dude, you waylaid that place. It was so well, good. The, it took me a minute. Cause I was like, my first idea, I was like, oh, that's going to be a problem. I was going to go up on stage and I'm like, this is his moment. Then my second idea was, you know how he always like talks about who's in the crowd and why they sit next to each other. I didn't do that. I was going to get up and be like, oh, you, this whole table has STDs, the same one, incurable. I thought you guys could get together and figure out a solution. So that was my second idea. And finally, I remembered he sh showed like Canadian money in a slide. I'm like, oh, Canadian money isn't real money. I'm going after it, right? Yeah, and uh, and that uh, gave me my lane. <laughs> Deeper one, man. There were so many good ways. You didn't even, you didn't go. I would have just, I would have waylaid the whole virus vaccine thing with Canadians and made half the room so fucking angry they would have left you threaded a lot it didn't even make everyone you hardly made anyone angry I, there was definitely something minutes later that was in contrast to what i said but i was like you know it it worked out it was fun it was uh you know and then so that's true yeah. i was laughing a lot it was good yeah it was yeah, man, I got it. I'm, I'm excited because I, in my own life, you know, I sold my business last year, but um, I have a, a licensing deal. So I still have like some appearances. And I, I know you still do you still do the workshop for Scribe? Do you still I do. show I up think and do that? Last, I think we just did one in August. I think it's my last one or I might have one in September or October, uh, November. I'm yeah. not sure. I recommend people go to that if uh, if it's if there's a last one coming up September, like move your stuff, get there. It's super helpful yeah. and be useful if you're writing in any book. And but like I've been able to write so much because I've had that same operator that I sold my business to. So even when I was there, it's like different. Like he's the opposite of me. Every he's like always put together, tie like consistent, calculated, looking at the numbers every day. Like I'm more like chaos and creation and those kind of things. So. So you found you found the right person. You're willing to give up um, equity in order to do that. Now you have equity of a bigger pie, even if you have a lower percentage, oh, and you've been out. able to do other things. I, oh, I you, actually, you're totally out now. Yeah, because what Javon wanted to do was um, his name's Javon McCormick. He's he just wrote a, a book, his second book called Modern Leader. It's really good, 
and he wanted to raise money to scale the company, right? And so uh, what we decided to do was kind of kill two birds with one stone. So he brought in partners. He got to pick who the partners were. I'm like, whoever you want, I'll find one. And then they put a bunch of money in the business and then bought me out as well. Um, not for any other reason than I'm like, I just don't want to have to think about this anymore. You did your like, thing. Right. I did my thing. And like, I didn't, it, I didn't want to have a large, very large portion of my net worth in a company that I had no control over or oversight of, or even right. visibility into, you know, and it's not fair to them. Like they, it, my skin's not line. Like I'm just gonna sit on my ranch and cash checks. I mean, I guess I could, but that, eh, that was a little, that feels a little sketchy to me. So not illegal, right, so but it's like I'd rather not. Just not. So what are you up to now then? You've sold that you're uh raising animals and you know shooting a I mean, bow to, to be totally frank man what i am doing right now is getting ready as best i can to uh survive the coming disastrous chaos that's already right. descended but has not really fully hit yet and so um like that's why i'm on a ranch. I mean, my wife and i always wanted to live on land and raise our kids out here and like this i mean this is my actual ranch it's not like a green screen and um so like that we wanted that anyway, but like, uh, you know, man, I've got generators and buried propane tanks everywhere, solar, rainwater backups, uh, you know, like a well, you know, all the food storage. You're Mormon. Like, you know, like I'm more, I'm, I'm not I'm Mormon. Mormon. What, what made you think I was Mormon just because I'm from Utah? Up. Yeah, right. Just because my great, great, great grandfather was a president of the Mormon church. Okay. They, so you are. So, uh, you know, uh, the Mormons are the OG preppers, man. I've been learning about like, about how to like store food for Mormons, man, because you guys are badass at it. And so, um, uh, like all of that sort of stuff, uh, not like a lot of people think of prepping is like, oh, I'm going to go live off the grid in the woods and eat bugs. And, no, man, I'm not, dude, that's nonsense. But like, I want to be sovereign, right? Meaning I yeah. own and control the most important inputs in my life water food power things like that um i am not subject to uh other entities that could potentially make me do things i don't want to do by withholding food or water or power or whatever and so that's that's what i'm doing yeah i've got a, i've got a, all that stuff. i've got a cabin with a water share we've got a buried propane tank i think i'm gonna do a second one we're adding a generator we've yeah. got you know <clears throat> We've got a pond stocked with fish. We're on a river that we could fish. And hopefully I put more elk in the freezers this year. You know, um, it's I'm good Texas, meat so and good gotta, I got to shoot like three whitetails to get close to half an elk or something. But, yeah, but I know you're ahead of me because like I can't, I still, I haven't, I gutted a deer when I was like 14. And then the last, all the elk I've had, the guides always do it. I was going to do it last uh -huh. year. Are you and, serious? Oh, see, now, now I take back all the shit I said about you that was cool. You go on such white glove hunts that you make other people gut your animals. No, when I went to New Mexico, it was on public land and I got the elk. And then we had fog descend upon us and the temperature drop. And so I was moving too slow. So the rancher just started like grabbing it. But we had to go two miles with this massive animal in seven pieces it was brutal man but yeah i'm a i'm a baby i gotta figure out a little bit more about like you know butchering the meat and taking care of everything i'm a little bit uh too metro still what can so i say I, please tell me you're at least eating the liver well i blew up the liver last year so i didn't eat it that year yeah but i we even were soaking the heart and eating the heart you, do okay. you know warren phillips I don't know him, but I know who he yeah, is. Yeah, I took him hunting, and, and uh, he shot the smallest deer ever shot in in the world. We couldn't see it because it was in the weeds. And so we ate that heart, but that was like one bite. I was like, dude, this is the veal of deer. It's so small that if his daughters knew what he did, it's like you – or like the one that killed Bambi, but then you decided instead to Still kill the, the baby. Yeah, so yeah, there were spots on it, dude. It was, it was, and then we had to go to the, to somewhere in Montana with it. And someone said, oh, I'm not afraid to put it down. I'm like, it's not my deer. I didn't do this, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, yeah. yeah.
<clears throat> so you've so you found out how to you know bait you're just hanging out with your family you're doing some writing i'm sure you're a shaman now apparently for the I right price know. i know i am just messing with you <laughs> I, I help people integrate that means after the session i'm not sitting for no 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 could you imagine how dumb would that be? Like, I'm gonna sell drugs to people on my land and put a lot of wealth at risk for that? No, no chance. I, it's amazing, and I'm I'm glad people do it, but I'm not doing it. Not here. No. Yeah, yeah. So, so what's next then? Just hanging out? Um, everyone always asks that question. So I'm a, I'm a first by uh, start by. Getting... I, I know you're prepping. What yeah. prep? What yeah. prepping right. things well, should people be focused process. on? Um, oh, you want to talk about that? Like, what should people? Yeah, do? yeah. What should saying? they be prepared for? I'm telling you, man. People, there is a storm. I, I'm going to sound like Game of Thrones, but winter is coming, man, and I mean that literally. All signs point to an extreme, at least in North America, an extremely cold winter. Um, and uh, what that means, it's going to mean two things. And I, I hope I'm wrong about this, but I think it's going to mean two things. F food shortages are almost inevitable this winter, regardless of, of how cold it is. Maybe not in North America. I mean, we've already seen massive shortages around the world, right? That's right. definitely coming. Okay. It's, I mean, it's not coming. It's here. Like, whether it's uh, what Ecuador, Ghana, Sri Lanka, like huge shortages and riots. The, I think this winter is going to be cold. Uh, uh, for the northern hemisphere very cool and i think uh that's going to exacerbate already fragile supply chains and a lot of other issues plus on top of it we have what is a managed decline like is absolutely intentional um uh, essentially world energy's supplies are being just intentionally destroyed by by politicians and other activists and um so the price already like you look at the price of energy right now in germany it's i think it went up something insane three four x in the last week um like rationing firewood like literally they're talking in germany like about like people are going to freeze to death right regardless it just in a normal winter in germany how cold it is uh, uh like they're telling people like you need to have firewood <laughs> it's like we're not gonna have power in the winter in germany germany yeah. Right. And so, um, if, if this is a cold winter, I think things are going to be bad regardless. If it's a cold winter, it's going to be really bad. And so, if you don't have, at a minimum, if you don't have stores of food, things to help you deal with the cold, um, man, you might be in a real bad spot. A real bad spot. And I think that's like literally just, that's like the shit you need to stay alive. Um, uh, beyond that, Man, I like I, what I I tell everyone is like, look, if you are not really focused on increasing your sovereignty the best way you can, which, you know, if you don't have much money, there's still a lot of stuff you can do. Um, uh, and quite honestly, some of the laziest, most screwed people are some of the wealthiest people I know because they think they can buy their way out of anything. I think we're going to go into a period, at least a short period, where that's not going to be possible necessarily. And so um, what increasing your sovereignty really means is, like I kind of said before, um, do you have access to the things you need to survive without having to ask permission to someone else or submit to someone else's whims? Good right? definition, or even, yeah. Or not even just people. I mean, like when the Texas, when the winter apocalypse hit, hit Texas two years ago, I mean, it's not like there's some government... Unless there is a, a weather control system, which I do not believe, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, like I haven't gotten it full Alex Jones, definitely not. But um, that wasn't that wasn't some person trying to control Texas. That was a serious weather event. Right. And then, how did uh, you handle that? Were you I, in this ranch? Uh, no, I was not. Um, I, you want to know how I handle that, dude? I got really lucky. True, true story. I lived in Barton Creek, which is um, that was back when I lived in Austin. Barton Creek is one of the super fancy, wealthy suburbs where a lot of the politicians live. And so that grid was protected. Never shut down. So uh, luck, I, pure ass luck. Uh, uh, I had literally three, three different sets of friends and family have to come to my place to stay. And I had a guest house. We had a ton of space because like, they were on a play in a place where the grid was just shut down for five days in like 10 degree weather which in texas is like that would be like minus 20 in utah 
right? Like that's like, and that's death weather in Texas, right? Roads were frozen. Yeah, we. My wife was coaching her friends in Austin how to handle stuff. No, it, was, it was pretty chaotic. Like, no one knew how to drive here. I had just gotten a six hundred pound delivery, like a I think it was a half cow. It might have been a full cow um, delivery, like three weeks before winter apocalypse. And so we had all the food we needed. I had to, I, I grew up in driving in snow, Chicago. So I kind of know how to, how to drive yeah. in snow. I had to drive, uh, I drove 200 pounds of it into the offices of Scribe because we had literal, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. We had dozens of millennials who were like on Slack being like, well, uh, I'm down to Cheetos, one bag. That's all I have. And we're like freaking out. And so like, I mean, there were eight, nine, 10 hour lines at HEB, the grocery stores, people fighting in them. Like it got, it got my buddy who's a sheriff who I roll with. Uh, there was a, not long, there was about an 18 hour period where things were really hairy and sideways. And he goes, talk to Tucker, like uh, he texted me, I texted him for something. And he goes, oh, cause I was gonna drive the stuff and describe so that like the millennials and the other unprepared people could walk into the office because the Muslim live downtown and get some food. And so I asked him like, hey man, how are the roads looking, you know, driving, whatever. He goes, well, you know, if you got chains in a truck, you'll be fine. If you're not a driving snow, you'll be fine. He goes, but dude, be careful. Uh, uh, it's West Texas justice out there right now. And I, at first I didn't quite understand what that meant. Because <laughs> I'm not a share, like I don't speak fluent. Right. Talk. What that means is no one's coming to save you. And if someone fucks with you, kill them. And the sheriffs aren't going to fuck with you afterwards. Like in what, because the story is in West Texas, justice used to start with a dead body. The sheriff would show up and the first question he would ask is, did he need killing? And if someone had an answer about why he needed to kill him, then that was the end of the investigation. And I was like, holy shit. Like, what are you kidding? <laughs> no, because dude, there was a period, like, I'm not kidding, about two days where every major road you went down was littered with cars like on the sides of the road, because it, like the storm came so fast and so hard. There were all these abandoned cars. People had to walk home, people robbing other people. Like it wasn't covered well in the news, man. But like it was, if it had gone on for two or three or four more days, things would have gotten really bad, really yeah. bad, you know? And so like having, do if let's just say you can't leave your house for two weeks for any reason, doesn't matter what the reason is government meteor whatever um do you have enough water do you have enough food food and water at a minimum and then do you have some way to create temporary power or warmth you know like it doesn't have to be you know, i was talking about like oh yeah i can live off grid for two years no i mean like you don't have to go from zero to that there are steps in between and most people are not prepared at all in any way shape or form Right. That's what I'm talking about. I mean, in the last few years, I've got, I'm, I at least can fly fish. I've got a pond stocked with fish. I've got propane tanks, but I'm, I'm still, you know, a little bit behind on some of this. And I do think that there are many factors that can happen that everybody's seen supply chain issues, but just look at how crazy it got for that 18 hours because things were no longer available. Yeah. And when people get into a deep sense of scarcity and survival, it's pretty insane to see. I mean, I've watched it happen in business where people are the different people when their backs against the wall than what you see when everything feels okay or abundant. So, you know, people have an innate, innate like desire in nature to protect their family and, and what that protection looks like is not what they would do in a normal situation. Yep. Exactly. Dude, exact. I cannot, it was breathtaking to me how, weird it got for and it was dude what happened in texas minnesotans wouldn't have even closed school over it. like it, right it was, i've been in minnesota when it was negative 22 before wind chill and people are like their job is to go start vehicles that have frozen that's their job they have a special tool i was like people chose to live here they're pretty damn tough people in right. minneapolis man <laughs> so it's it, it's not like it, it's just understanding i think we're going into a period that's going to have at best case scenario, I think the next call it five to 10 years, but definitely three to five are going to have a lot of very chaotic uh, pockets, right? 
And that's the best case scenario. Worst case scenario could be way, way worse, right? There could be extended periods of a lot of violence and other things. Um, How much of this is uh, fabricated and created by government and organizations and those kind of things, you know? know? You, you know, like, I don't spend a ton of time. You're just like, I'll be prepared. Yeah, right. Like, I mean, I could, if I wanted, spend a bunch of time figuring out, okay, is Klaus Schwab... But we're not going to stop it or villain, change it. Is, right. Is, is Klaus Schwab a clown or a Bond villain? I mean, like, it doesn't matter. Right. Like, it really doesn't matter. All that matters is that I know... Um, okay, we are going into a transition period. The American empire, as we understand it, not the Republic, because that fell a long time ago. The empire has fallen and, um, and, and uh, the bones are being looted and something is going to emerge out of that. But first it has to, people have not, it has to collapse. People have to realize it. And then all the chaos that comes from that, um, that's coming. And it how might, is this different? How is this different than like the preppers of like the oil embargo days or the people, you know, like how is this kind of storm different? So the, the main way I think it's different is the mindset. Uh, there's a couple different things. So okay. um, uh, one is that old school preppers mindset tended to be it tended to fixate on nuclear war, right? Because the worry for 60 years was the Russians were going to drop bombs, the Soviets are going to drop bombs. And so like the way you prepare for the aftermath of a nuclear war is pretty dystopian <laughs> and depressing, honestly. Yeah. I don't think I, I don't think anything like that's going to happen, right? Uh, now, is it impossible? No, it's not impossible. I just don't think it's likely. And so right. I, I, what I'm doing is not I'm especially not... when we have viruses. Why would you why would you ruin the the structures when you could just <laughs> remove the people? Kill everybody, right? <laughs> um uh, so uh, I I'm uh, what I'm doing is trying to change my life so that regardless of what disasters hit, uh, You're I just hope, ready. I, I'm ready for them. I have a much better chance of surviving and not just surviving, but thriving, right? Like a lot of people, like the old school nuclear preppers, like, okay, I have a bomb shelter and I have two years of food in there. I'm like, what are you going to do? Spend two years in a shelter eating cans of beans? Like, that's horrible. No. I'm not. Whereas, like, if I couldn't leave my ranch for two months, I'd be fine. Like literally, if the power went off, the grid went down, and I can't leave. I mean, I'm not going to say like it's pleasant, you know, especially if the grid goes down in the summer, right? And we got a ration AC and stuff, you know, with solar or whatever. But like, I'm going to be fine. Like, we're going to be totally fine, you know. And so, yeah, like, I mean, even being prepared with what I have with my cabin um, just made the COVID shutdowns. Like, I don't mean to sound insensitive because I cared about the disconnection people felt and not be, but like we had some of our best days just hanging out up at our cabin because we were walking around without masks, not watching the news, not, yep. you know, having that. We're just, it was a different world and having preparation can provide a different world when everything else is chaotic. Doesn't mean again, that you're not compassionate. It just means that you're prepared. Yeah, exactly. And, and I pre- COVID, like in 2019, um, I, I think of this as two things. One is insurance. Well, actually, the first thing I think of is I actually want to live this way, right? Like COVID was a, an impetus for my wife and I to go do the things we'd been saying we wanted to do, but weren't doing. So like, even if I knew for a fact nothing bad was coming, I'd pro I maybe I'd be on a different ranch, but I'd definitely be out on land uh, doing exactly what we were doing. I wouldn't have spent as much money as I did on ammo or solar or whatever, right? Like I, I, I would have a lot more money in the bank account, but um, my life would be very, very similar. Um, uh, so that that's one, but the other, I th all the other money I spent is, I see it as insurance, right? And I think like in 2019, uh, like to make a, a metaphor, like you don't need flood insurance everywhere. Like in 2019, I lived on a mountain, so it was stupid to get flood insurance. But then in 2020, I mean this metaphorically, it's like I moved to next to a river and I'm, I'm far above it, I, but I'm on the thousand year floodplain. And on the thousand year floodplain, everyone say, ah, you don't need insurance. It's only every thousand years. I'm like, eh, I think we're to appear where the thousand year floods are coming, right? So I'm gonna buy, you know, I'm gonna build a wall around the house and buy insurance for the thousand year flood because it went from basically uh, impossible, at least in my mind, yeah. to now a flood's coming. The only question is, how big is it going to go?
you know? Well, I think it's healthy to think of it as insurance. And I also think it's healthy that you're not sitting, you know, thinking about this every day and in ruin about it. You're just simply preparing. That's what I'm gathering. It is literally a problem to solve. Um, You know, if we are going, all all things move in cycles, right? All. History is no different. Governments are no different. Social movements are no different. And the cycle we are going through is one of a lot. I think we're hitting a lot of different ones are coming to a head at once. There's just going to be a lot of chaos. Like if you, if the last two and a half years hasn't convinced you that there's a lot of chaos coming, I'm not sure what to tell you. Bless your heart and have fun <laughs> living in the pods and eating the bugs. But I'm not going to do that. I, I'm going to spend my time creating the, both the life I want now and then building that life so it is resilient against um, almost any change that could potentially happen or any any shock that could potentially happen. Not well, imperfect, thanks for, just resilient, you know? Well, thanks for giving us a wide variety today from writing a book to uh, MDMA therapy and, you know, <laughs> then into growing and oh, scaling a business right. without destroying your life and then, you know, prepping to handle whatever is going on. So I just appreciate you taking the time. It makes it entertaining and educational at the same time. Yes, thank you. Thanks for having me, Gary. All right, man. Well, it's, uh, it's good to good to see you. Look forward to hanging out in person sometime. Uh, you know, I guess that might have to be in Texas since you're going to be, you know, hanging out at your ranch more often these days. I don't than... know, man. I, I could go to Utah. Like, uh, I have right. a newfound affinity for the for the Mormons. <laughs> it, well, it's, it's funny. Like, you know, Jeff's not Mormon. Patrick's not Mormon. I'm not Mormon, but I'm still being lumped in because I'm I'm of this uh, of this state, I guess, in your mind. You look like Jesus. So you're going to have to be lumped in with some religious group. You might I look like you. Utah Jesus, not real Jesus, just <laughs> right. Utah Jesus for Utah sure. Jesus. Old, old Utah Jesus. Not even the, you know, yeah. <laughs> All right, man. Well, uh, uh, you know, tell your wife I said hello. Give her my best, and uh, you know, uh, I'll I'll try to make sure to gut my own uh, animal this year so I could earn back some respect. I, I definitely, truly. All right, later, man.